Greetings. Welcome back to Black Bear News, where we are discussing climate change, abrupt climate change, and things adjacent. I'm just going to cover a couple of articles for you today. Strange weather or climate strange. Uh, I'm going to rename climate change, climate strange. Uh, maybe that would be a good t-shirt, climate strange. Good band name, climate strange. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. Uh, got this off of Nick Humphrey's feed. Global food crisis ahead as extreme weather events devastate crops and fields around the world. It's from May 20th. It's not just happening in the USA. Nope. Extreme weather events are devastating crops and thus the food business around the world from Australia to North Korea and Argentina. Here are the latest reports of food shortages around the world. Australia... Imports wheat for the first time in over a decade after worst drought in 116 years. Australia is normally the biggest wheat exporter in the Southern Hemisphere, but the prolonged drought has fried its grain crop in recent years. In 2018, output tumbled 20% to just over 17 million tons, the lowest in more than a decade. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, on May 9th, 2019, the Australian government had no choice but to import 60,000 tons of wheat from Canada. Uh Uh-oh. Flood, hail, and bad weather affects fruits and vegetables in Italy. According to some sources, it is estimated that over 70% of uh, basilicata, sorry, I'm destroying that, stone fruit has been lost. Basilicata, that's what it, thank you my brain, I'm thanking my brain, has been lost, alarming uh, percentages considering that the agricultural sector is the cornerstone for the economy of this region. Planting in France has slowed down by extreme cold temperatures. Corn sowing in France slowed again this week, losing its lead uh, to last year after persistent cold weather continues to hamper the central European nation's planting efforts. Sound familiar? Severe drought devastates crops in Yucatan, Mexico. The drought in the Mexican state of Yucatan has put the agrarian sector up against the ropes. More than 3,000 producers have been unable to save their crops due to the lack of irrigation infrastructure. Lowest rainfall in 100 years leaves millions at risk of starvation in North Korea. North Korea's worst drought in decades is being driven by the lowest rainfall in a century, according to the country's official state newspaper. Spring's record late arrival in parts of the U.S. has catastrophic consequences for food industry. Food prices set to rise. The calendar might have said it was spring more than a month ago, but the physical signs of it around us told a much different story. According to officials' data, this was the latest arrival of spring in 38 years of records. Uh, For parts of Kansas and Oklahoma, portions of Washington and Oregon also saw the latest spring start on record. Also, Los Angeles, uh, it's currently 15 degrees um, below normal, it is very, very cold, and it's 58 degrees currently on May 23rd in Los Angeles. Unbelievable. Um, cracks are appearing in the edifice of modern agriculture, Australia's biggest grain producers. Revenue collapses after horrific crop losses. Floods leave 600,000 hectares of crops damaged in Argentina in a recently released report. The National Institute of Agricultural Technology estimated that there are 600,000 hectares of crops affected by heavy rain and flooded roads, which interrupted the harvest of soy, corn, and alfalfa crops. Um, So, yes, this is happening around the globe. Uh, you know, we'll see how long it takes to hit the actual, you know, um, hit our supply chain. Moving on to this from EcoWatch, drastically shorter work weeks needed to fight climate crisis study finds. Um, I'm laughing because yeah, people need to stop, basically stop going to work. One of the, one of the best ways you can fight, fight climate change is stop going to work. Uh, but actually, everybody has to do it. And that's why 
I really think that we need a political plan. Um, we need some kind of political or social, you know, organization, organized plan around climate change because just telling people to stop doing something by themselves totally is like, what? I can't do that. Uh, I can't stop going to work. I can't just move out of the city into the country and just start my own farm. Um, hoping everybody will follow me. That's not how it's going to work. It's going to have to work if people understand uh, there's a consensus of understanding among the population like, oh, I see, this is really bad, so we all need to together go do this or stop going to work. If people in three European countries want to fight the climate crisis, they need to chill out more. That's the conclusion of a new study from the think tank Autonomy, which found that Germany, the UK, and Sweden all needed to drastically reduce their work weeks to fight climate change. The rapid pace of labor-saving technology brings into focus the possibility of a shorter work week for all. If deployed properly, Autonomy Director Will Strange, or Strange, not strange, but Strange, said The Guardian uh, reported. However, while automation shows that less work is technically possible, the urgent pressures on the environment and our, on our available carbon budget show that reducing the working week is, in fact, necessary. Yeah, reduced to, like, you know, nothing or <laughs> a couple hours a day or different kind of work or work that's paid in a different way. The report found that if economies in Germany, Sweden, and UK maintain their current levels of carbon intensity and productivity, that means production, they would need to switch to a 6, 12, and 9-hour work week respectively if they wanted to keep the rise in global temperatures to the, below, to the below 2 degrees Celsius promised. By the Paris Agreement, the Independent reported the study based its conclusions on data from the UN and OECD Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development on greenhouse gas emissions per industry in all three countries. You can just extrapolate that out to, you know, every other industrialized country, right? U.S., China, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. They're just taking in these three countries. The report comes as the group Momentum calls on the U.K.'s Labor Party to endorse a four-day work week. We welcome the attempt by autonomy to grapple with the very real changes of society we'll, that society will need to make in order to live within the limits of the planet. Uh... In addition to improved well-being, enhanced gender equality, and increased productivity, addressing climate change is another compelling reason we should all be working less. Moving on to, I've covered this before, but here is a new or a newer um, edition of this story. Scientists discover China has been secretly emitting banned ozone-depleting gas. Of course they are. Scientists found that between 40 and 60% of the total global CFC-11 emissions originated from eastern China. A chemical ban around the globe for the last 30 years has made an unfortunate resurgence, and all signs in a new study point to China as the culprit. In the 1980s, countries came together to sign the Montreal Protocol in, in on substances that deplete the ozone layer, a landmark treaty designed to halt and reduce the production of uh, chlorofluorocarbons, Say that 12 times fast. Chemicals used in fridges and foams that have the side effect of tearing through the Earth's ozone layer. So this was back when people saw a problem and then were like, well, of course we have to do something about it. So then they did something about it or tried at least. The Montreal Protocol has been signed by 197 countries around the world, including Canada, the U.S., and China. As the ozone layer in our upper atmosphere slowly depleted, letting in increasing amounts of the sun's ultraviolet rays, the protocol contributed to significant reduction in harmful CFCs. That is until last year when scientists from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Association found the global emissions of tri uh, trichlorofluoromethane have actually been increasing, increasing since 2013. The increase implies... That someone was secretly violating the Montreal Protocol, but the limitations of measuring devices meant the location of the polluter could only be traced to somewhere in East Asia. Um, with the help of an international network of measurement devices designed to identify and track gases in the atmosphere, the team behind the study found that, that data from their devices in Korea and Japan had spiked since 2013, after analyzing weather and wind patterns, patterns to determine the origin of the gas increase, it led them to eastern mainland China around the Shandong province. Um, so 
people are illegal. The Chinese government has been cracking down on illegal CFC 11 manufacturers, shutting down production of facilities in the Rigby, hopes this new study will help law enforcement officials, officials, officials in their search for illicit producers. Uh, non good. This actually makes me think about those articles I've read about increases of methane release and scientists going, we don't know where it's coming from, but they're able to trace uh, chlorofluorocarbons coming out of Eastern, you know, a specific region of the world from China because they used measurement devices in a coordinated fashion in order to figure out where these gases are coming from. But yet I've seen articles where scientists were like, where's all the methane coming from? We don't know. Stupid. Anyways, moving on to my last article, Jeff Bezos wouldn't even come on stage to listen to his employees who want Amazon to address climate change. I love companies that use, um, that have names or logos or images that, you know, make you think that they, you know, they're like, oh, Amazon, the earth, um, polar bears, bears. I know I'm black bear news, but I'm actually, I care about the earth. Uh, you know what I'm saying? They, they use these kind of, uh, Patagonia, you know, they use these images and these names that make you think, you know, that make you go like, feel good about, oh yeah, the earth, green, um, and they, they're destroying the earth hand over fist, all of these companies, um, because they're producing things that harm nature, okay? At Amazon's shareholder meeting today, employees and investors, investors voted on a wide-ranging spate of proposals from banning the practice of selling facial recognition to technology to adopting a serious plan to address climate change. Each of the proposals ultimately failed, but they are, were undeniable signs of a paradigm shift underway at the online retail giant and perhaps the tech industry at large. Few, if any, such shareholders... Uh, share, shareholder proposals have been made before, and CEO Jeff Bezos all but refused to acknowledge them because they would uh, impinge on your profits and future profits. That's why. <clears throat> Beginning at the end of the year last year, a number of Amazon employees, like UX designer Emily Cunningham, filed identical shareholder resolutions asking the company to release a comprehensive plan to tackle climate change. The company responded to the resolutions by announcing Shipment Zero, an initiative aimed at reducing carbon emissions associated with package deliveries. How are you going to do that? But it provided few specifics about how those reductions would be achieved. How are you going to do that? Then in April, a group called itself, calling itself Amazon Employees for Climate Justice began circulating an open letter. Wow. Amazon Employees for Climate Justice. Asking Bezos and the board to support the shareholder resolution and adopt a strong climate plan. How about work, you know, which would mean working a whole lot less, which would mean producing a whole lot less or shipping a whole lot less or doing a whole lot less. It means um, taking your company down by several degrees of magnitude. That's how you fight climate change. Um, whether that ultimate truth will ever be realized. I mean, that's exactly why Jeff Bezos is like, I don't know, what are you talking about? Right? Mm -hmm. The le letter took off and nearly 7,700 Amazon employees have signed it marking the movement of one of the largest efforts to tackle climate change inside a corporation ever attempted. ISS and Glass-Lewis, two of the largest proxy advisors to institutional investors, came out in support of yes, a yes vote on the resolution. And yet, at their shareholder meeting today, Bezos was unfazed. Phasers set to unfazed. Though he was present, the CEO remained backstage. Unfazed. More than... 50 Amazon employees also attended the meeting, according to AECJ, where Cunningham delivered an impassioned speech to shareholders urging them to support the resolution. Dozen stood with her as she delivered her remarks. This is how Amazon employees fight climate change. You all walk out en masse, leave the cities in which you live, and go st start farms. And, you know, call the farms, you know, wherever I live, dot com. Um, you know, a field in Washington, dot com. Or something like that. That's how you actually fight climate change. You shut the company down. 
You shut the company down. That's actually how you fight climate change. If you really want to go, if you want to take the trajectory all the way to the end, um, that's what you have to do. But in the meantime, you could start just hacking away at it bit by bit, piece by piece. Uh, that is all I have for you today. Thank you so much for your eyes, your ears, and your conscience. If you would like to support this channel, you can do so at the links below. Until next time, peace. Thank you.